on high, from on high. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow by and by. Tread. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow from on high, from on high. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow by and by. Hi, I'm John Riley from NCTV. We're here at the Ruggles Center, which many of you may not know. It's a museum here on Nonatuck Street. 225 Nonatuck Street, Florence, that is dedicated to underground rugby and to Ruggles, a abolitionist, a black man who uh, was a printer and an abolitionist. Uh, today we have for you the relationship between shape note singing, Ruggles, and the abolition movement, led by Tim Erickson a great expert in shape not singing. So if you don't know about shape not singing, this is your big chance. Thanks. Well, that's uh, very flattering. I'm reminded of uh, the fact that I'm in a house of somebody with some real accomplishment uh, and a, an amazing life. I'm happy to be here. It feels like an opportunity, among other things, to celebrate freedom in all its various manifestations as well as music and, and local history. I'm grateful to everyone involved for your work here at the Ruggles Center. Um, I probably have as many questions for some of you as answers today. Specifically, I'm indebted to uh, Sarah Lennox and to Gerald Clark, who have conspired to bring a regular shape note singing to the Ruggles Center which is what inspired me, uh, what kind of sparked me to propose this event. Um, rather than a formal paper, I'm going to give you a series of vignettes, two or three, depending on, uh, on time, with singing, that will give you a sense of what on earth shape note music is, if you don't already know, and how it relates to some very local history involving abolitionism, community singing, and local people of African, European, and Native American descent including David Ruggles. It may be a barrage. Mm -hmm. You may be left with more questions than answer yourselves by the time I'm done, but I hope that you'll also be left with a sense of curiosity about what may be some surprising local music and history. Uh, before I get started, for those unfamiliar with him, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of David Ruggles all of which I learned from reading these walls, no new information. Um, he was born in 1810 in southern Connecticut, became a businessman, author, and prominent anti-slavery activist in New York City, supposedly helping some 600 people escape slavery, including Frederick Douglass, for whom Ruggles became an important mentor in abolition work. With the help of Lydia Mariah Child, who is, that room is dedicated to, Ruggles came here to what used to be Bensonville, now Florence, of course, in 1842 to recuperate from a serious illness at the Egalitarian Communitarian Northampton Association for Education and Industry, which you are, many of you probably aware of. If anything that I'm saying about local, like, you know, the, the silk mills and all this stuff doesn't make sense, stick around afterwards and read the walls. Um, and uh, after, after that, he established a successful hydropathy um, practice in town and lived here until he died in 1849. Uh, two, let's see, where are we here? Two books of sacred music, both of which are largely comprised of the two major intertwined... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> genres of music or musical trends that make up what we have come to call shape note music. Those two genres are uh, the earliest hymns by mostly amateur New England composers from about 1770 to 1819, thereabouts. Um, Northampton was an important publishing center for that music. You used to be able to find locally published books from the late 18th century for a buck at yard sales. No longer, mm -hmm. definitely not since eBay. Um, so that's one. The second musical trend that is represented by the term shape note music is the popular or folk hymns associated with the ecstatic religious revivalism of the 19th century, especially 
the often huge outdoor camp meetings that took place all up and down the eastern seaboard and beyond, including in Northampton, places like down in the meadows and other places. Uh, if you can imagine five to 10,000 people singing and praying and shouting out in a field in the middle of the night, in the middle of the 19th century, that's a place to start in imagining those. For simplicity's sake, I'll refer to the styles as the early music and the revival music. Mm. That's just what I'm going to call them for now to, to make a distinction when we need to. Um, I told you there were two books that I was going to start with. The first book is The American Vocalist, 1848. This copy right here that I got for $3 at a junk shop a long time ago belonged to William Clark and his brothers Jerry and Daniel. William owned the paper mill down the street where the cutlery building now stands, less than a mile away. Um, he sold 94 acres of his land, uh, which became part of the home of the first local silk mill. His brother Daniel was a great fan of this music and an influential song leader in Northampton. He led the singing at Edwards Church. He was one of the founding members. Uh, he led uh, concerts and, and other things. And he bequeathed this book to his daughter Amelia, one of the prime movers in his, the, the, historic, the Northampton Historical Society before it became historic Northampton. You'll find her name on all kinds of, you know, eight, 17th century uh, Native American baskets. She donated all kinds of stuff. But her book with all her notes and her family signatures and notes about where they sang the songs wound up in a dustbin, which I got for three bucks almost 30 years ago. Um, there's a note in the back that she was still singing these songs over and over at the age of 94 in 1944. And we'll sing some of her favorites. Um, the second book is The Christian Liar, L-Y-R-E. Oh, you can see it there. Um, compiled by Joshua Levitt, whose name appears multiple times on the walls of this house. Born up in Heath in 1794, a lawyer, preacher, editor, tune book compiler. Uh, I believe he had a practice in Northampton briefly before moving to New York. Uh, and most famously, a dedicated abolitionist. Levitt was an associate and friend of David Ruggles in New York City, where they did abolition and publishing work together in the 1830s. Ruggles certainly knew the Christian liar, and I, I'm sure he sang out of it. He would have had to work pretty hard to not sing out of this book. This was the, the premier uh, revival um, hymn book from the whole period when it was first published in 1831 up until the Civil War and, and beyond in some places. All right. Among other things, Levitt is remembered for his advocacy of the Mende rebels who commandeered the slave ship Amistad in 1839. If you've seen the 1997 Steven Spielberg film, 442, clue guys, 442. Uh, if you've seen the 1997 Steven Spielberg film, you may remember a scene in which a group of white New Haven abolitionists sang a hymn as the Africans finally set sail for home we won their freedom in 1842. The hymn was Boston music reformer Lowell Mason's 1832 missionary hymn, which we're going to hear now. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Blah, 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 missionary hymn. <laughs> probably how most contemporary Americans would expect white Victorian New Englanders to, sound, to sound. This maybe is the hymn these characters' real life counterparts sang on the dock that day. They surely knew it. But there's another song also composed in New England that I know some of these same folks sang, maybe not at the dock, maybe not in regular church services, but they sang, if you could turn to the next, 
they sang this. because they're too hard to sing along with. Oh, mm -hmm. Jordan is barely a dozen years older than Missionary Hymn, but it represents a whole other side of early American music, one that is perhaps unexpected for many people. Um, it's a representative of the earliest form of American music at the heart of the shape note music repertoire, which I, again, I'm calling early music for our purposes. In the late, late 18th and early 19th century, most people in British North America learned to sing using what is still known as the British solfege, fa sol la, fa sol la, mi fa. The idea behind using differently shaped note heads for each syllable was that it would simplify reading music and sell music books. The 1801 tune book, The Easy Instructor, the copy here that belonged to a family in Northampton, um, introduced a system that became so popular, at least in what was then considered the South and the Far West, like Ohio, <laughs> that it's still in use today. It's basically just standard notation with added information that helps singers get oriented within the scale. The, this, the, the, this notational style, I'll show you, became so widely used in books containing the two kinds of music that we're talking about, that over time we've come to call all of it shape note music, just broadly. Uh, I point out that the notational system itself was not very widely used locally, although the, the music was. Much of it, again, even first published here. Um, so shape note is, the term shape note is slightly dubious, but it's a, a convenient term. It's a, it's a familiar kind of catch-all phrase. Uh, so let's let's sing it. Um, and every kid pretty much, uh, if they were learning how to sing, didn't matter if they're. Uh, ancestry was European, African, Native American. If they were learning to sing in British North America, this was pretty much the way that they were learning, whether or not they were using shapes. Um, how does this all relate to abolitionism, David Ruggles, um, African Americans in New England in general? 
sort of leap right to one example. On the evening of December 31st, 1862, African Americans across the country gathered with their white brothers and sisters for so-called rejoicing or watch meetings waiting for the Emancipation Proclamation to take mm. effect. At the stroke of midnight, 40 everybody, at the stroke of midnight at Tremont Temple, a stone's throw from, Boston, from the Boston Common, the enormous crowd assembled erupted in this old song. You just have to imagine three or four thousand people, the stroke of midnight, the bells start ringing, and they start singing. <coughs> and please do feel free to sing along with us. This is the melody here. complicated answer is it, it really depends on when and where. I'm going to turn to 86. 86. We are singing out of, um, this is uh, from the inside of the Christian lyre, but we're going to sing it uh, with all four parts. We sing out of a, a different book. We sing out of two uh, living contemporary shape note collections. A lot of the music is crossed over, so I just wanted you to see the, the version in the, um, in the Christian lyre. The tune is the same, it's right here. Um, so just another example of this, of this music. La, 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 la. Second, to uh, thank all my great singing friends. I'm sure um, this is a, a different experience than it would be if I was trying to do this all on my own. <laughs> I hope you, you appreciate appreciate that. Um, that is by Timothy Swan from Northfield, Mass. He was a hat maker there. He started composing when he was 17 years old. Eventually, the mercury got to him, and he moved to uh, Vermont. Um, song Poland, just out of curiosity. A lot of the song titles are named after towns. There's, there's a tune called Northampton, Hatfield, 
uh, Wendell, believe it or not, Montague, Greenfield. Um, this, however, this one, Poland, was named after the country in celebration of Poland's constitution. There's a kind of a brotherhood between, brother-sisterhood between the U.S. and Poland. Um, and, and the town of Poland in Maine, if you ever drink Poland spring water, is named after the song. So next time you pick up a Poland spring water, well, I got to stop and shop, but I know that you're drinking something that was named after one of these old tunes. Unintentionally. Um, How does it happen unintentionally? Well, the, the, spring pe the spring water people didn't know they were naming their water after uh, a song. But the guy who named the town knew he was. Okay. The town of China, Maine is also named for a composition of uh, Timothy Swans, which was the, one of the two most popular funeral hymns of the 19th century. You can look on a lot of the old gravestones between about 18, 1800 and um, 1890 or so. And you can find it inscribed sometimes in the bottom. Daniel, Ma Daniel Russell Clark, the owner of this book, there's a note here that that song was, it says, uh, mother's request at father's funeral. Apparently 800 people singing in uh, First Church. All right, these are all asides. Here comes another even bigger aside, um, but a fascinating one, an aside to our discussion of this colonial and early federal era music. Um, while Connecticut's shape note innovator Andrew Law's competing notational system really never took off, he taught music all up and down the eastern seaboard for over four decades. One of his most successful students was a man named Newport Gardner, or Akramar Mariku, as his birth name was transcribed. Stolen from West Africa at the age of 14, despite being enslaved, Gardner managed to study music with Andrew Law and become a prominent singing teacher and composer in Newport, Rhode Island in the 1780s, 90s, and beyond. Uh, widely accepted as the first known published composition by an American of African descent, his piece Crooked Shanks, a dance tune, appeared in the, an 1804 compilation printed, guess where? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> don't know why they don't tell us that in school, but... <laughs> Newport Gardner is an absolutely fascinating guy. Um, oh, and I thought that the, the singers would enjoy seeing this. Um, so the difference between Andrew Law's notational system was that the, the fa and the la were transposed, so la was triangular and fa was square. <laughs> so if you think that you're not using the shapes, try reading that. <laughs> it's, it's like through the looking glass. <laughs> the rest of you, I don't know, probably doesn't look that, that much weirder than the other. But. Um, yes. Okay, early shape note scholar George Pullen Jackson, for complicated reasons, um, coined the term white spirituals to describe the music he found being practiced in communities singing from southern shape note collections, like the Sacred Harp that we sing through, from. Uh, the term was embraced largely unquestioned by the public. It was kind of understood as just like a, a mirror image of, of black spirituals. Oh yeah, white spirituals, okay. Uh, and it was, um, it was accepted by folklorists like Alan Lomax, who disseminated the idea to the extent that it's still in common use. You can still find it people using that term, even though it is completely inaccurate. It's, it's bogus. It's wrong. The, um, many of these songs were born in the camp meetings that we talked about, the, the religious revival. started about 1798 in Kentucky, swept up and down, all up into Canada, like wildfire. The term wildfire was even coined to describe the camp meetings. Got to England and Ireland because of one very interesting Connecticut guy we don't have time for today. Um, but when some early accounts of the camp meetings, one of the complaints by white kind of upper class people and re musical and religious reformers, one of their complaints about the camp meetings was the revival songs that they associated with um, African Americans also present in those events. One white woman's account of an 1838 camp meeting attended by 7,000 people um, made note of the power of the singing by the comparatively small number of black singers who were apparently drowning out the much larger group of, of white singers. She also noted that while the singers in the white camp had retired by midnight, the black singers were still going at 5.30 a.m. when she finally fell asleep. This is one of many what, what some scholars have 
said or proposed are Africanisms, examples of Africanisms in American mm -hmm. culture. The idea of singing all night. Um, the colonials, they may have had a dance at midnight that went till you know, one in the morning and then had, had lunch <laughs> or breakfast. But the, this idea of singing all night, uh, some have argued, was, was um, a direct importation from African practices. Oh, no. Colleague and friend Sojourner Truth was renowned for her, singer, for her singing of just this music, which played an important role in her speaking and preaching. In the 1850 narrative of Sojourner Truth, which you can buy here around the corner if you can find your way there for five dollars. Um, her friend Olive Gilbert vi vividly captures a scene from a local camp meeting, again probably now by the Meadows, maybe someone knows better than I, uh, in, that she attended shortly after moving here in 1844. I'm tempted to talk about the Millerites, but there's a poster in that, that front hall. It was a Millerite camp meeting. It was an end of the world apocalyptic thing, let's oh. say. Um, a gang of rowdies attempted to break up the meeting, and at first she hid behind a trunk for fear of being targeted as the only black person there. But gaining courage, she decided to put a stop to everything. And Gilbert writes, and quote, the meeting was in the open fields, the full moon shed its saddened light over all. And the woman who was that evening to address them was trembling on the preacher stand. The noise and confusion were now terrific. Sojourner left the tent alone and unaided, and walking some 30 rods to the top of a small rise of ground, commenced to sing in her most fervid manner, with all the strength of her most powerful voice, the hymn on the resurrection of Christ. It was early in the morning, it was early in the morning just at the break of day, when he rose, when he rose, when he rose, and went to heaven on a cloud. You'll have to read the book to see how her singing stopped a riot. So it's a good, it's a good story. Um, I've never been able to find the tune for this song, the, the, which I just read. Apparently her favorite song, she referred to it that way. But we can sing some others. I am confident she knew. Let's, well, we'll sing, I'll give you one. If you guys will turn to 87, we'll sing something before that. Uh, but just to, to be ready. Um, here's a song that comes right out of 1843, 1844, the so-called failed apocalypse, the Millerite. Apocalypse that never happened. Some called it the Great Disappointment. <laughs> um, the chorus goes like this. Oh, there's better... Oh, no, I'm not going to do that one. Gabriel's going to blow from on high, from on high. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow by and by. Try it. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow from on high, from on high. Oh, Gabriel's going to blow by and by. Judge descending, descending, descending. All you see, the judge descending on that great day. All Gabriel's going to blow from on high, from on high. All Gabriel's going to blow by and by. All you see, the dead are rising, arising, arising. All you'll see. the 
circle be unbroken, unbroken, unbroken. Lord, may the circle be unbroken on that great day. Hungarians going to blow from on high, from on high. Hungarians going to blow. Right out of Amelia Clark's book. That's the kind of thing. Now, this is my spin on it, and I have a take, you may have noticed, a perspective, a historically informed opinion. But that's the kind of thing that, that some folklorists heard and said, well, yeah, it kind of sounds left African. Maybe it's Scottish. <laughs> and went to a great deal of effort to, to establish it as having come somehow from the British Isles, but it's, I think, pretty clear that this is an Afro-Celtic song from the state of Maine that made its way up and down through these Millerite conventions that were, and uh, camp meetings, that were um, renowned for, if not equal participation, or participation <coughs> on an equal level by people of different racial backgrounds, at least more active participation by people of European, African, Native, all backgrounds kind of mixing it up, hearing each other's sounds, coming out with music that hadn't yet existed, a kind of music that hadn't yet existed. Right. Here is another example of the same kind of, the same kind of song. Um, I'm less confident that Sojourner sang this one, but I would not be surprised. It's at least um, definitely illustrative of the, of the form. Um, and it's a kind of a kind of a call and response thing, a chorus, a chorus song. All for a glance of heavenly day to take this stubborn heart away. Oh, there's better days coming. Will you go along with me? Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. Let's try that chorus. Oh, there's better days coming. Will you go along with me? Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. And thought with beams of love divine, this heart, this frozen heart of mine. Oh, there's better days coming, will you go along with me? Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. The rocks can rend, the earth can quake, the seas can roar, the mountains shake. Oh, there's better days coming, will you go along with me? Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. Some sign, but this unfeeling heart of mine. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. To hear the sorrows thou hast felt, oh, Lord, and Adam and would melt. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound the jubilee. But I can read each move. Line, and nothing moves this heart of mine. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. There's better days coming and the sound of Good neighbor, I'm sad to leave. Goodness and wrath in vain combine to stir this stupid heart of mine. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. Yes, there's better days coming and the sound of Divine can do the deed, and Lord, that power I greatly need. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound you believe. Thy spirit can from dross refine and melt and change this heart of mine. Oh, there's better days coming when you go along with me. Yes, there's better days coming, and we'll sound you believe. there that we all know how to do from happy birthday was apparently something <laughs> apparently something that they did after spinning the same song for 45 minutes you, you heard perhaps in that first song especially I don't know if you 
calculated, but it didn't rhyme. It didn't need to rhyme. All you needed was seven, sen seven syllables mm -hmm. vaguely related to scripture or the end of the world, and you had a new verse. <laughs> and, a, and a compelling song that just kept turning around and around, that, that could be, as you saw, very easily participated in and learned by anyone. Um, sing you the song. This is the version of this song that the Hutchinson family sang. They were one of the, the groups that popularized this song. They came, uh, okay, Hutchinson family, uh, pretty much the first touring family band in the nation. I think it was 1840 or so. They hopped in a, a wagon, three brothers and a sister, with a cello and some other instruments, and they performed a combination of sacred, patriotic, secular, and reform music, and it'd be kind of mashup. It became tremendously, hugely, immensely popular. They performed at the Northampton Association of Education and Industry in 1840, somebody might know better than I, uh, with a, to an audience including Sojourner Truth and uh, other local people. It's another example of one of these camp meeting songs, but the version that we're going to sing is not exactly like this because you don't need to know. <laughs> we're going to sing 87 out of the Sacred Heart, but you can sort of follow along and see what we're doing here. Um, and I should point out while I'm looking for my page that a lot of these songs, we, we, they have been sung continuously since they were first published, since they, or not even published since they first existed, since they came into being. People have been singing them. Not here, per se. Not in any one location for that whole duration. But they have continued to be in, in common use. All right. Sojourner Truth sang a song, I'm on my way to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> For understandable reasons. A desirable destination, still. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean that to be a political comment, but... Um, in this copy here, that belonged to Amelia Clark, if I can find the page, under this song, a good friend of hers, after she died, went through and annotated all kinds of things that she remembered about Amelia's singing. And one of the things is, here we go, under this song, in quotes, she wrote, her friend wrote Amelia next to it, and then transcribed Canaan. Canaan. So, I'm bound for the land of Canaan, or there's another song, I'm on my way to Canaan. 
It's also in this book. I'm on my way to Canaan, I'll bid this world farewell. I'm on my way to Canada. Um, connections. Another connection. This song that the Hutchinson family sang here in the 1840s for or with Sojourner Truth, the song that was sung in the camp meetings, is also still and for a long time has been the song that um, southern kids in Alabama and Georgia and Texas and Florida panhandle, the first song often that they learn in a shape note singing school, still today. Um, and it's thus one of the least popular songs amongst the adults. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. We don't. I was going to sing one more out of the Christian harmony, but it's. Uh, there's not. I think it's too hard to, to read. But just another example of uh, uh, a camp meeting, a farewell song. They were kind of songs designed for different parts of the camp meeting, for 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 marching in like a processional for um, all kinds of different points and places within the camp meeting, and then a parting song. We still sing a parting song every time we get together. Sometimes we'll sing two. Um, even if we know we're going to see each other six days in a row, like we did two weeks ago, some of us. Six days in a row of, of singing. Still sing a parting song every time. Um, all right. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> but do you have any questions at this point? Yeah. In the, in the back. I, I had a question. Uh, were these songs were always written out first, or people didn't just... Question whether these songs were written out. Uh, no, many of them, so the earlier music tended to be written out in manuscript or in print. That's how it was mostly circulated. Mm -hmm. These revival songs usually evolved spontaneously or just were transmitted orally until they were written down by somebody like Joshua Levitt, who actually put out an advertisement in his paper saying, if you want, I'm going to put together, I'm going to print some of these great songs that nobody's ever written down before that we've all been singing at the revivals. If you know how to write music, please send me your favorite song. So that's where he got most of the music for the Christian lyre was by soliciting it from people who knew it from singing in revivals and camp meetings, but had never written it down before. So he documented a lot of the music that otherwise would not have... Uh, otherwise would have been lost. Um, yep? I've heard this music, I didn't understand what it was. Would you explain what's going on when you sing the notes? So when it's I'm just a regular, yeah, what, singing, what's going on when we're singing the notes? Um, it it's just a regular, oh yes, so fa is triangular, sol is round, la is square, and mi is diamond shape. And we just sing it through on the notes first, mm -hmm. to, because we do. <laughs> um, but that's all it is. We're just singing the, the solfege syllables. Um, did, uh, did you have a question? I, I was just curious about accompaniment. Did, okay. did the camp meetings have musicians besides the singers? The camp meetings, now, asking about accompaniment uh, is a bit of a kettle of fish or worms or whatever. <laughs> can of worms. Yeah. Um, the, the camp meetings, if you have you know 4,000 people worshiping and praying and singing spontaneously out in a grove, you're not necessarily going to have a, certainly not an organ. Um, maybe there would be some spontaneous musical instruments here and there. Depending on the denomination, musical instruments would not have really been allowed or enjoyed in that context, in the context of sacred music. In churches, the, uh, the early music was initially unaccompanied. The first instrument to be introduced was the church bass somewhere between, or a single bass, somewhere between a cello and a stand-up bass. So before they had, if you go up to the Williamsburg church, they still have one. They were often carved by the deacon, by a deacon or by the preacher, or by the song leader, whatever. Homemade kind of folk bass instrument that, that doubled the bass line. Uh, this was about the time that choirs were being formed. Um, it got to the point where it was common to have a church band, where you have a, a bass, a clarionet, a flute and a fiddle, or violin, doubling the four harmony parts up with the, with the choir. But that varied from town to town, especially within the congregational churches, because everybody, meaning white men of property over the age of 17, <laughs> voted on everything. So if they didn't want musical instruments, there could be a fight, there could be a church, a new church would break off. 
people started two services before, you know, the contemporary worship and um, the tr traditional worship services. Uh, there were church, the, the, the same thing was happening. Southampton Church, Congregational Church, they had an awful fight there, between, generational fight along the level of what music and what accompaniment they were going to have. Uh, and that was, they were doing a dif different thing there than they were over here in Northampton. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the back. Um, is this another can of worms to ask you about West Gallery singing? Can of worms to ask me about West Gallery. The gallery in the uh, churches, uh, typically the pulpit facing the West, the pulpit in the East uh, facing the West, you, the gallery up top, many of the, many of the uh, federal era churches featured a gallery up there the church seating in congregational and other churches was very hierarchical, racially, uh, be, be racial, gender, age, property, you know, uh, uh, economic lines. So people owned their pews. The gallery was typically reserved for, um, for yeah, for slaves, then African American, free people, Native Americans, and uh, and kids. But that's also where once the choir started forming, where they tended to go. When they actually petitioned to be able to sit up there, there, there was a, I guess it is a can of worms. Up in Cummington, if you go up to Cummington, the, the church in 1803, the, the town uh, voted to $10 for music books, uh, a church base, and to teach some singing schools. A guy named Royal Joy, that's his actual name, Royal Joy was the first singing school teacher bitter enemy of uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes's dad, um, <clears throat> like you are, like one is, and he, <laughs> so he, I, I found this out and I thought it was so great that his name was Royal Joy, and it wasn't until a year later doing more research that I realized when they hired him, he was 12. <laughs> so they taught a 12-year-old boy to buy some, to, to they, they paid a 12-year-old boy to, to get the young people together to sing this music, and then there's a record, there's a local church record up in Cummington saying, that the, the kids basically had petitioned saying, can we all sit together? And the deacon said, if half of you will join the church, I'll let you sit together. <laughs> so they were, they were all into the music. They weren't so much into the church. Um, but, so that was case by case. A lot of places, the, 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 um, the choirs wound up in the West Gallery. The term West Gallery music has been used in England to refer to kind of the English, the closest equivalent of what we're calling shape note music here. The, the parish church music that happened up in the West Galleries. Another interesting thing for our local history and particular subject, and since we're already into a can of worms, if you look at the 18th century, 17th and 18th century records, there's very little information about singing um, by, among African Americans, Native people. You get a few isolated things here and there. So there's no kind of association, if you look at any history book, any music history book, um, that isn't specifically devoted to African American history, you'll see basically nothing um, about New Englanders of African descent singing any of this stuff. I will get to a thing that will explain something in a minute. But at some point it dawned on me, I, I encountered an example of um, some a black community in Hartford, which we'll look at in a second, singing something that people, when I first told them, did not believe me that I said that they did. I said, no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, then it occurred to me that, okay, not only were black New Englanders in the same churches as white New Englanders until the formation of the, the separate black churches in the 1820s, 30s, 40s. But that was, you know, I had always imagined, I don't know about how much you know about the history, but I had imagined, like a lot of people did, that there were always just kind of separate churches. The black people had a church, the white people had a church, and they had different music in the two churches. Up until the uh, black members of congregations in New England, in places like Hartwell, all over the place, got sick of not being able to vote on their own church, their own preacher, their own music. That was when they formed their own groups. It was their decision to form a church in which they had a voice. Um, but before that, they had grown up generations of people singing the same music, the music of William Billings and early New England that we've been looking at so far. Um, not only had they grown up with some of that same music, but they had no choice but to sit exactly with the choir. 
because that was the place of the lowest status. The West Gallery was the place of the lowest status within the, within the whole church. So, can of worms closed. I should <laughs> probably move on. I'm desperate for one more. Jeff. Um, you use the term Afro Celt. Yeah. There, there's a world music band recently called Afro Celt, uh, something other, and I always thought that was like a, a new coinage. Well, it is, and that's my that's my buddy Simon. Uh, he's got a band called Afro Celt Sound System. Yeah. And they were being kind of. Yeah, I mean, they, there's a couple of like English Irish guys and a couple of West African guys. Yeah. In kind of world music group, a cool, you know, funky, you know, multicultural thing. They coined that term, and I just kind of applied it because the, the song Gabriel's Trumpet is so clearly an Afro, an actual Afro-Celtic song. Yeah. It's yeah. it has the and so many of these have they seem to have clear influence of the different groups of people that not surprisingly that were mixing it up together. People of English, Irish, Scottish, African, Native descent. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Well, what about, well, did, did the congregation clap? Well, the congregations, the you see this a lot. Well, this was, again, something that was introduced and voted on. Hmm. Oh, okay. This was the before the introduction of the earliest New England compositions that we've been looking at. People sang in a, a different style that we won't get into that, was, that had no particular beat. It was very long and slow and beautiful. Uh, maybe we'll do that another time. But people in the 1720s, some Boston folks, got the idea that that was a little too country. It was a little bit too old school. They wanted to get into a little bit more regular kind of music. The term they used was actually to regulate the music. So when Royal Joy was hired, he was hired to regulate the music, which means to introduce a degree of order, rhythmic um, uh, order, and this was leading. The first thing you see when you go to a sacred harp singing, people going like this, that was the idea of everybody singing together on the beat. It was regular singing. They even called it regular or scientific singing. We <laughs> talk about uh, old folks concerts, which I give you, you've been staring out here for a while. I recently, or two years ago, finished a 26 years of research to write a 390 page dissertation. So please don't ask me any questions. <laughs> Be here for another 24 years. Uh, I'll try to be succinct and clear about it and how, how they relate to the local um, story and music that we're talking about here. Um, in 1853, a bunch of senior citizens in New Haven in April decided that they were going to put on a concert of the sacred music of their youth, including New Jordan. These were some of the New Haven people I was talking about who were active in the abolition work there, although they were colonizationalists. Apologies to any Garrisonians. Um, but they were the ones I was talking, the same people that would have been that would have been working with Joshua Levitt to support the Mende. They were amongst the senior citizens of the city who staged this novel concert that was a huge hit. They sold out all the tickets, they had to stage another one, they had to stage two more. It became uh, a craze. It traveled up and down, it traveled up the Connecticut River Valley, or traveled, sorry, from New Haven to Hartford, then from Hartford to Westfield and Springfield. Northampton was the fourth city to ever hold one of these, led by Daniel Mansfield, uh, Daniel Russell Clark, excuse me, Amelia's dad. I don't know if you can keep track of all these people. Uh, out of this book, um, so the idea of senior citizens singing the sacred music of their youth that had been kind of shunned, pushed aside, became such a it became so popular that it spread all over the place, jumping out to even within a matter of months out to um, Wisconsin and all up and down. To the extent that in the winter of 1856, there was a front page article in the Boston Herald that called it an, um, an epidemic. <laughs> so it was very popular. And they started out in a broadly abolitionist um, community and traveled, it was all sort of within these, this particular group of congregational Whig slash Republican, once the formation of the Republican Party happened in 1854, um, anti-slavery people, for whatever reason. It was, it was exclusively within those, those quarters that it happened. They were, not all of these concerts were explicitly abolitionists. A lot of them were just kind of more New England nationalists, celebrating the local history and culture and 
and the, the you know the um, the music, but there were some that were very uh, explicitly abolitionist. I don't know if you're familiar with the term Henry C. Wright. I think he might appear in here somewhere. Henry Wright was a militant, um, a, a militant abolitionist associate, a good friend of uh, William Lloyd Garrison's in Boston, who, according to an, a letter that he wrote to Garrison after he saw a concert in Greenfield, he talked about how they used to sing out of this book, the Garrison's inner circle, they sang this old music, which was not being sung in churches, which was not, it was, had really been shunned. But that, that was their music of choice, or one of their kinds of music of choice, was th um, some of the stuff we've been looking at. Henry Wright was visiting his friend Charles Fisk, uh, who had an, it was a, a station master on the Underground Railroad up in Greenfield, and they, they led a, an enormous old folks concert there at the, t the old town hall. So if you can imagine like a couple of thousand people listening to a couple of hundred local senior citizens singing old music led by a militant anarchist, that's the fall of 1854 in Greenfield. Singing a song called Greenfield that had been composed by a Massachusetts composer to honor the town of Greenfield. That's local. Um, Another person who, who participated in leading that, one of the preachers involved was so Edward, Edward Hitchcock, the president of Amherst College, the dinosaur guy, the ravens, Noah's raven. His brother was uh, a preacher from Deerfield who apparently was always barefoot, uh, even in the winter. So it's an 80-year-old barefoot preacher adds to the scene. They did have a band. Charles Hovey, the flute player, lived in the house that's now the Greenfield Library. You can see his picture in there. That house was built for Joshua Levitt's grandfather in Charlemont, and they moved it from Charlemont to Greenfield. Okay. Is this going to be on the test? Yes. <laughs> All of us. Who, who, whose grandfather lived in the house that was currently occupied by George Hovey the day the, anarchist, the militant anarchist old folks concert in Greenfield? Joshua Levitt. Okay. Um, so th this is... This is uh, the, and when I say militant, I don't mean like really into it. I mean like, let's send them guns. Um, supporting the, the League of Gileadites down in Springfield. I don't know if you're aware of that. John Brown, a lot of people don't know that he was a local for a lot of his life, important segments of his life. St. John's Congregational Church. St. John's Congregational Church, the only congregational church named St. Anything, named after John Brown, <laughs> abolitionist martyr. Um, Brown came back to Springfield to worship at the Talcott Street, uh, uh, sorry, the Sanford Street Church where he had worshiped earlier, a uh, black church in Springfield, in order to help organize a chapter of the League of Gileadites, which were described as being armed to the teeth and uh, walking the streets of Springfield looking for slave catchers. So if, if it's just, I don't know, it's worth considering. Yeah. We're thinking about it. Um, think the 60s were bad. Yeah. Um, we were good. Um, right, this is, this is militant anarchist Henry Wright writing to his friend William Lloyd Garrison the day after this concert. Uh, he said, many old folks and young folks were there and their hearts blended in loving harmony around the domestic shrines of the past, meaning those old songs. And the awakened sympathy was all directed to the desolated homes and blighted hearts of the slave. So they were using the emotional attachment, the beauty of these songs, the power of this singing, to work on people to say, come on. Hampshire County, Old Hampshire County, was, was not that left. There, it was considered, especially Northampton, was a very conservative place. There were, it was obviously a hotbed of, of Underground Railroad and anti-slavery activism, but it was a tough nut to crack, and this, this music was one of the things that these people found was a way to get to people's hearts. To say, that reminds you of your grandma singing to you, doesn't it? What do you think that kind of memory feels like for somebody that's been sold away from their, their family? Um, to hear the music that, that they, for, of their youth. So, there's a, a really clear connection. Here's another clear connection, too, uh, between this music and abolition. Deep breath. On Thursday, April 17th, three days before Easter, 1862, you guys know where I'm going with this. <laughs> The lead story in the local papers, papers was the signing into law 
of a bill emancipating all enslaved people in the nation's capital. It was before the, the general emancipation. That night, 30 black singers traveling from Hartford, many of them senior citizens and calling themselves the Colored Old Folks, performed to a capacity multiracial audience at the city's prestigious 1500 seat music hall on the corner of Main and Kinchin Streets. Their program centered in the sacred music of their youth, the music of William Billings and the other early New England composers represented in the shape note tradition. Old and young alike dressed in colonial era costume, embodying the founders in costume and song 150 years before the hit musical Hamilton. <laughs> um, which I, I make it that deliberate, it's not just a joke, it's actually interesting, N not entirely disconnected at all. Huh. Um, led by Mr. J.F. Hazard and longtime abolition and black suffrage worker Perry Davis. Okay. Uh, led by Mr. J.F. Hazard and longtime abolition and black suffrage worker Perry Davis, they began their concert with William Billings' 1787 Easter Anthem. Here's the, the, um, the opera house and the, and the, uh, so the music halls, the opera house is here and the music halls here above the stores, the corner of Main and Pynchon Streets in Springfield. Uh, all right, 2.36, and I'm going to try to, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, get out of the way in time. All right, we're just going to sing the words. Just kind of place yourself there. Imagine this group of 30 or 40 African-American, or people of, of African as well as Native <coughs> and European uh, descent, performing for a large um, multiracial crowd in Springfield the day of the announcement of the this flooding of people in the District of Columbia when emancipation, local emancipation was announced. Just the words. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that's there.
so that is a previously unheard part of the Abolition soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about my leading there. At first I was thinking, okay, I can do this and they can see me, and of course, the, <laughs> I didn't realize that I could just do that and you could see me probably better. <laughs> if I ever need to use multiple computers, I'll remember. All right. Um, as I mentioned, most old folks concerts were not as overtly abolitionist as the Greenfield concert led by uh, Charles Fisk. But they were very much concerned with progress, reform, charitable giving, institution building, innovation. They embraced New England nationalism and exceptionalism for better and for worse. They claimed the region as the moral and historical heart of the nation, the apex of history, <coughs> the center of the universe, ready to lead the world out of darkness. <laughs> Still the way a lot of people think New Englanders act. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps some of us do. At a time when antiquarianism itself was a progressive activity, around the time when a lot of libraries, historical societies were being formed, antiquarianism itself, yeah, it, antiquarianism itself was a, a progressive activity. The concerts embodied what I've called to, come to call a progressive antiquarianism, looking to the past to find a way forward. For black New Englanders and Americans in general, issues of change and progress obviously had special urgency in that time period. With their unexpected costume, at least from our vantage point, and the humorous Yankee interludes that they included in between songs, we could imagine um, the so-called colored old folks were just playing. My sense is that while there was an element of play and the concert was reported as fun, apparently wonderful singers according to reviews, it was certainly not a joke. No one in the audience could have missed the contemporary resonance in their performance of Jezemiah Sumner's 1798 patriotic ode on science with his word, the British yoke, the Gallic chain, was urged upon our necks in vain, all haughty tyrants we disdain. Nor could they miss the shared history and contemporary solidarity voiced in the song's concluding line, Shout Long Live America. No one who knew his story could have mistaken for a joke the costumed presence of Holdridge Primus, whose grandfather had emancipated himself, as had so many other New Englanders, by donning similar clothes and taking the place of a white man on the front lines of a war that had failed to deliver its much sung freedom and equality to so many. Even their use of the term colored rather than African was quietly strategic. In opposition to the design of the African colonization movement, these old folks were saying, I believe, okay, we're not going anywhere, we're from here. Maybe more from here than you. If you look at the uh, editorials by Samuel Cornish, the founder of the Colored American um, uh, magazine, the, the title of the magazine was very intentional. It, he said, we're not African, we're from, we're from here. Um, and he, he, he even goes so far as to say, we may be more truly American than our, than our white brethren, I think referring to the native ancestry of so many um, people in the, in the region. So I think, I think they were saying, we're not from here, uh, we, we are from here, we're not going home anywhere. Mm -hmm. We want to fight, which uh, Connecticut Regiment's got the, the uh, earned the uh, right to do in 1864, and we want to vote, which was earned or at least for black men in 1870, something that Perry Davis had fought for since at least the 1830s. Um, in their fine singing and dignified bearing, the group embodied the words of one of their early pastors, James Pennington. You'll also see his picture uh, in, on the walls here. He was one of their, their first preachers who said, uh, he sought to prove the fallacy of that, quote, that f the fallacy of that stupid theory that nature has done nothing but fit us for slaves and that art cannot unfit us for slavery. Uh, the singers didn't advertise anything beyond entertainment, no political or social goal, no glaring historical fact. I don't think they needed to. I think that they embodied all of that and more, is being there by singing the heck out of this music. 
in their antiquarian singing and costume, I believe the colored old folks of Hartford came to Springfield to take America into the future. Thank you for bearing with the technical, the technical stuff. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, we'll probably sing a couple. Well, let's sing one and let's see if you guys think about some questions. Does anybody in the back have, a, have something you want to sing? Tim? Yep. Do you know anything about the native influence? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, the, the, in Natick, the best singers in the 17th century were known to be the native people, mm -hmm. the, the, the so-called singing Indians out there. Mm -hmm. There were communities of, of Native Americans that were uh, fantastic singers. They, they were involved. There's a story of a Connecticut preacher, Lorenzo Dow, had a dream that he had to preach in Ireland or he was going to die. The prophet Daniel came to him in a dream. Mm -hmm. So he walked to uh, Nova Scotia, somehow by way of the Thousand Islands. <laughs> and he heard, he was walking in the middle of the night and he heard this unearthly sound. When he got closer, he recognized these camp meeting tunes that he knew because he was present at some of the earliest camp meetings. But he didn't recognize the words. And he got closer and he found a group of 500 Iroquois um, having a camp meeting and singing the same tunes. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were there were a, a few influential, well, there was one particularly influential character, a uh, hymn writer, Samson Ockham, some of you may have heard of. He, among other things, raised a lot of the money that helped start Dartmouth College. Um, there, there were a number of other, a number of other stray bits like that, but um, yeah, there, there, there were certainly Native people who identified as Native uh, who were you know active in the churches here, active in music as well as in everything else, and within there's a, there's a great book by a, a guy at UMass, Professor Ron Wellburn, came out last year called "And Plato and the Borders of Native Identity," where he theorizes the the so-called black poetess, 17 year old Anne Plato, uh, from Hartford, as a native person, and looks for because there's no direct evidence, he looks in little sort of dusty corners for evidence of. Uh, native resonances and practices and connections um, and place sense in in Hartford and in the life of Ann Plato. So, within Hartford's black community, there there was, according to Wellburn, um, a kind of a, a presence of a native Native American presence that was masked by things like census language and just general ignorance, failure to write things down on the part of people who were writing things down. Um, you got a song yet? Anybody? Since when do we not have a song? Come on. <laughs> when you mentioned China earlier, yeah, should we sing that? China. Oh, yeah. Uh, 163, we got a call for. Imagine 800 people singing this in first church. And an old friend and family member passed. And I believe a bunch of us have sung this at way too many funerals by this point as well. La so fa so fa. Somebody back there want to lead it and I'll watch you guys? Somebody there want to lead it and I'll watch you guys? Is that easier? All right, okay.
It depended on the people. That a lot of the late 18th century folks were pretty pragmatic about it. Some of them were quite devoted Christians. Others, Joseph Stone was not a believer. He was just interested in music. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the, comp the composers, the, 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 these, that music kind of straddled the line between, that some people were uncomfortable with, between entertainment and, uh, and devotional music. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were others for whom it, it was, yeah, it, it, I, I think that, I'm trying to think of a specific example of somebody speaking directly of divine agency. And of course, a, a generation or two earlier, Jonathan Edwards was all about divine agency. Yeah. He was also all about singing. Yeah. Uh, he, Ed, Edwards taught some of the earliest singing schools in the area. They, Northampton, he had a bunch of kids singing in four-part harmony when the other villages and towns around we're still doing the lining out, the, the sort of arrhythmic uh, monophony, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. big word, uh, singing, the, just everybody singing the tune. Mm -hmm. That's probably my best answer okay. for a short Thank one, you. without thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to neglect to tell you or remind you that you're all welcome to come sing anytime you see there's a shape note singing, you're welcome. but. That would include every Tuesday night from 7 to 10 at Helen Hills Ch Chapel, except don't come last Tuesday night. <laughs> last Tuesday night it was at my house. It was the one time of the year, I think. It was 4th of July, so the chapel was closed. But normally 7 to 10, come at 7, leave at 7.05 if you don't like it. Come at 9, stay till 10, whatever. Uh, you're welcome to come sing first Sundays in Amherst, 2 to 4.30 at the Amherst Octagon. Which Thursdays, Gerald or Sarah? Second, second, first second, Thursday. second Thursday. Second Thursday, right here. Right here. At 8. Yeah, 8 to 10? 8 to 10. Uh, they're singing in Leiden, they're singing in Greenfield, singing in Brattleboro, etc. Look it up on the interwebs. One more question and close out? Or just... from on high, oh Gabriel's going to blow by and by, try it, oh Gabriel's going to blow from on high, from on high.